Hey everybody, welcome back to FRM 120. Uh, we're going to continue our uh, trek into the pneumatics world uh, for just a little bit more. I uh, want to apologize because um, I just realized that in some of my previous lectures uh, I've had a, an AIT 1003 screen up here. I do to copy some of the slides from there, but this is geared toward brewery, so uh, I didn't change that one slide over, but uh, I've just happened to catch that. But I got it now, so that's you know all that matters really. But anyway, we're going to move forward. Before we do, though, um, I want to back up for a second. Um, we talked about uh, atmospheric pressure and building pressure with air compressors and things like that. And we also said that, um, that uh, uh, air or any type of fluid is going to take the path of least resistance. Okay? So what I've, sh I've shown here, and a lot of students, this really helps them get their head around uh, atmospheric pressure and uh, its impact on us and things like that. As I stand here with you uh, right now, the, the atmospheric pressure against my body is 14.7 uh, pounds per square inch of my body surface area. That's what I'm feeling right now, okay? Uh, so uh, my body and then my body's um, uh, uh, internal pressure is equal to that of the external as well. So, but um, a lot of people think that when you are drinking from a straw and you're sucking water out of, your, they feel like you're sucking water or whatever it is in a cup through the straw into your mouth. That's not true at all, okay? Here's what's really happening. Okay, so we know that our atmospheric pressure is 14.7 pounds, okay? And that's the amount of pressure that's being applied to the top of this water surface right here. Just like I was talking about the, the uh, uh, pressure against my body's square, uh, the surface area of my body, okay? Well, the same pressure, it's the exact same pressure is being exerted on this amount of liquid in our, uh, in our cup here. Now, the difference is, when you go to uh, what you're doing when you when you suck on that straw, okay, what you're doing is you are creating a vacuum, and a vacuum is anything lower than atmospheric pressure, okay. So let's just use theoretical numbers, okay. Let's suppose we have we're creating a a, a pressure of say 10 uh, uh, 10 pounds per square inch on the inside of your mouth, okay, something below atmospheric. Remember we said it's going to path, follow the path of least resistance, okay? Well, if I've got atmospheric pressure at 14.7 and I've got something less than that, it's going to follow the path of least resistance and go to that smaller or lesser pressure, okay? So what's happening really is that when we create a lesser pressure in the chamber of our mouth, okay, we're sealed off and we're creating a lesser pressure, What's happening is the 14.7 pounds of pressure that the atmosphere is uh, pressing on this water surface area is forcing and shoving that water up in that straw. You're not sucking it up in there. The atmospheric pressure is greater than what's in, in your mouth and it is actually shoving the water up in through that straw into your mouth. So that is, I just, and I just think this is a really cool example because, you know, you're creating, you have the, the uh, opportunity to create a lesser than atmospheric pressure in your mouth. And again, everybody thinks, oh, I'm sucking that fluid right through the straw. You know, no, it's the atmosphere that's actually pushing it through the straw into your mouth. So a uh, little fun fact for you there. And it also just kind of helps you get your head around uh, atmospheric pressure and, and things like that. I just thought it's kind of cool. So I thought I'd share it with you. But we are going to go ahead and move on. We're going to continue to use this um, schematic, here's a general schematic. We're going to start dialing in a little bit more on some of the control devices in our control circuit and some of the actuators that we're going to use, okay? Most of the ones that you'll see in a brewery um, that we've talked about so far is something to do in the packaging line, whether it's canning or bottling, uh, sealing uh, the, the cans or anything like that. There's pneumatics involved, and of course we said that we don't want hydraulics anywhere near our beer or any other type of food substance uh, that will impact it and cause health hazards or, or some other type of hazard as well. So what we've got here is a filler assembly here that goes down into the cans, is dispensing CO2 and uh, beer at the same time. And there is a, this is a cylinder, there's a cylinder rod right here, an actuator, and it drops this whole plaque down and all four of these come down together. There's only one cylinder actuating it, but the motion of the cylinder is to extend and drop the tubes into the can for filling purposes. And then once they're filled, the cylinder will retract and pull them back up. Okay, most of you uh, are kind of familiar with something like that. 
Um, also, for uh, putting the lids on the cans, um, the sealer, uh, these, these uh, rollers here that will go in here and, and uh, with these dies on here and will shake the lid around the can. Uh, what they are doing, their cylinders right here, probably hard for you to see right here and right here, there's two cylinders that come in here and they're swinging these actuators in and out to, in order for them to be, uh, you know, get in there and make contact with the can. I'm going to post both of these up there um, on uh, Blackboard for you to see, watch them in action. They're just little uh, GIF files, but uh, they, they are pretty cool to watch uh, in action, but you'll see the cylinders working. And uh, again, here's uh, just another application as well. Okay, and once again, a platen that's being lowered and raised by a single cylinder. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about cylinders because they are a very useful component, very one that's used widespread. And you got a couple different uh, configurations with these, but again, both of these are going to be using pneumatics uh, air to make them extend and retract. Uh, we'll go with the simplest one first. Um, what we do here is we apply. Uh, pressure on the back side of a cylinder uh, piston and as that uh, pressure comes in here and builds up it overcomes the spring pressure and allows the cylinder to extend that's one configuration okay and as we take the pressurized air away as you'll see when it turns the light blue we take it away then the spring pressure is the dominant force it shoves the piston uh, this back uh, and makes it retract and it also evacuates the air that was once in there to make it extend. It evacuates it out of that chamber uh, back into the atmosphere. Um, and with this type of cylinder over here, we're using, we're, we're uh, relocating or redirecting the air, I should say, uh, on this cylinder. For example, we put pressurized force behind here, but pressurized air creates our force to extend the cylinder, and we evacuate this side. And then through a directional control valve that we'll be getting into in just a minute, we will shift directions of the pressurized air and then it will fill this side of the chamber or this side of, of the uh, cylinder and it will force it to retract and it will evacuate the air into atmosphere from the other side of the chamber. Now, that's just a couple of different types of cylinders that, that we're seeing, okay? Um, I want to talk a little bit about the externals, but first of all, I do happen to have a cylinder here. Um, it is it's, a, it's a, a training cylinder. It's one for educational purposes. We wouldn't use this in a real uh, in a real, real application. But basically, this cylinder here. I think you can see it here on the um, on the um, camera here. Uh, you've got a piston right here that separates one side of the chamber or one side of the barrel from the other. Okay, and there are two seals right here, and our air would enter in this side. It would fill up to a pressure to overcome the friction of the seals on the, on the barrel. I can press it and, and make it just a little bit of friction. Um, and so what we do is we apply air pressure to this side and then it forces the cylinder to go and retract in that way. Now, what here is the, here's the uh, exhaust port. This is where the uh, air from this side of the chamber exhausts out into the atmosphere. Okay, but we'll have our pressurized line here of, uh, to force it to go that way. Now on the flip side, we will reverse the direction of the pressurized air. We'll take it from this port to this port, and then all the air will get behind the piston on this side, and then we'll cause it to extend, and then we are evacuating the air from this side out, the, out of this port into the atmosphere. Now, if I had plugs in one end of this, we would not be able to move it because we would be trapping that air. We'd move it a little bit because we could compress. I'll move it this way. We could move it this way and compress it because as we said, the, uh, the uh, air will compress unlike fluid. Now, if this were full of hydraulic fluid, I could not budge it. And we had this plugged off. I could not budge it at all. Would not be able to because I could not compress the fluid. However, with air uh, or a gas, we can. I'd be able to compress it to a certain point and finally it would it would stall out because I wouldn't have enough force in my hand to push it and it would probably kind of kick back on me because it's, it naturally wants to expand so that it can continue with that chaotic movement of the um, air molecules. But that is a cylinder, some tie bolts there to hold it all together. Uh, there's your rod side and this is your uh, entry side here uh, or they call it, sometimes they call this the rear end. This is the rod end and the rear end. Uh, but uh, and uh, this is a little seal right here around the shaft because it, the shaft has to slide in and out of this 
um, this uh, end, end cap. And so we want to make sure that no air escapes out because any lost air is lost force, it's, it's inefficiency, it's waste. So we try to keep it trapped in there and there's a nice little seal in here. Um, I'll show you, I think I've got a breakdown here coming up. But this is a directional control valve. This is the top off. They've kind of done a cutaway of the valve. And this is the same thing I was kind of showing you. We're going to have our pressurized air. And depending on if we energize our coil or not, if we energize our coil, we're going to have air coming into one port, okay? And then this one will come back, and, and this port will uh, allow the air to exhaust the atmosphere. So we'll get behind there with the pressurized air. And this is the seal, this is the piston that's got a cutaway. So here's our two seals right there. Okay, and we're going to fill this chamber up with air, and it's going to force that cylinder to extend. The rod will come out and actuate whatever it is we're going to actuate. Perhaps that, that filler platen is on the end of this, and it's mounted vertically, and it's going to bring that platen you know, in and out of the cans that we're filling, using that example that we had previously. In our directional control valve, if we shift our spool, let's say we, let's say we de-energize our coil, and our spring takes over, our spring force takes over, it's going to shove that spool this way, and then we're going to uh, put, a, it's going to redirect the pressurized air to this side, and it's going to fill this side of the chamber with air, uh, and then it will cause the piston to move in this direction, causing the, the rod to come in, okay? And then the air on this side will, will be routed back through here and expel into atmosphere, okay? But that's just, uh, you know, and there's a lot of different co configurations of cylinders and directional control valves. I don't want to, like I said, I'm not trying to make you into fluid power specialist in this class. I'm just giving you enough information and kind of getting you familiar so that you can read a schematic, understand what the component does on a general, on a general level. You won't be taking cylinders apart. You won't be taking valves apart. You'll be replacing them, but you need to know how to, they work, okay? So anyway, moving forward, this is a little bit bigger one. Uh, this is actually a hydraulic cylinder. It's got a little bit more seals in it. But again, here, the, the main point is that you've got a piston here with a chamber on one side of the piston and a chamber on the other side. Now, this chamber has more surface area for the air to get behind the piston. This has less surface area on the piston side because part of it's taken up with the rod itself. So we're going to have more force on the extent side than we are on the retract side because there's not as much, there's not as much surface area to, uh, for the air to work with, uh, work against on the piston. So uh, if we have 100 pounds of pressure and we multiply it by the surface area of our piston, and we're not going to go into the, 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 uh, the math on that one, but if we've got it, that we, we would take that force, multiply it by the surface area, and that's the amount of, of, of force that it can extinct, that it can exert. Well, if we take that same, say, 100 pounds of pressure, we put it on here, our surface area is less, so our, our uh, pressure times a lesser surface area is going to give us a lesser force, so the lesser force on the retract side uh, is going to be less than it is on the extend side. So my point in this whole diagram here, or for image, is we've got seals. Um, we also have an end seal. This is the rod seal right here uh, that keeps it uh, from air expelling, and it also keeps air from coming back in, and air has contaminants in, that, that get trapped inside, and it can start to wear out, you know, grit and dirt and things like that can get in there and start wearing seals out over time. So we keep this sealed up for, for a couple of reasons, for those, you know, those are two reasons that, uh, that they uh, serve. Um, you've got some guides here that keep the, keep the uh, load of the cylinder nice and linear. Um, and so that, that as it extends out here, it's not kind of flapping like this, you know, wearing this, wearing this seal out. These Teflon guides right here, uh, or hard plastic guides, will kind of guide it out there and make sure it stays centered in the seal right there so we don't get ex excessive wear once it gets out there and starts to extend like that. But that's just a breakdown, uh, just to kind of show you uh, what's on the inside. So, uh, again, some more. Um, we have uh, the port that, our, that we pour air into. These here, depending on which direction our valve is, whether this is pressurized and this is exhaust, or whether this is pressurized and this is exhaust, will determine which way our directional valve is, is uh, pouring the air. Again, this is the piston, the rod side here, okay, and we've got two different chambers there. But this is just a breakdown of stuff so that a lot of you uh, may not have ever had the opportunity to take a cylinder apart or see one in action, or maybe see one in action, but now you know kind of how it works. 
Okay, so uh, I want to go back to our, some of our drawings here. Um, again, we said that this is our symbol here for a solenoid coil. Okay, that pulls that uh, that pulls that um, uh, spool that's right here. It will physically pull it into its magnetic field, and uh, it will shift that valve. So right now, as it stands, if, uh, what we're doing is we're applying 24 volts. Okay and we're allowing our pressurized air, giving it a path through the spool, to pass through that spool and on the, the, the uh, back side of this piston uh, of our cylinder. And as our pressure builds, it, it gets, uh, it, the pressure starts to build and overcomes this spring pressure, okay? We talked about springs. Notice these two springs look very similar in their drawing. So we get enough pressure behind there and it extends that cylinder. Meanwhile, we're evacuating this side of the, the piston into atmosphere. Now, sometimes it just, it, uh, in, in a spring actuated cylinder, we just evacuate it to the uh, atmosphere. Sometimes we route it through a valve, but in this case, we're just, we're just evacuating it into the atmosphere, okay? So when we take our 24 bolts off, our, our, valve, our um, spool shifts, and now we, we have a, a different path through the spool. We've blocked off our pressurized air, so we're no longer pressurizing this side of our piston, okay? So um, we block that air off. Now the spring pressure can take over, and because we've given it uh, the air a place to evacuate, which is in the atmosphere through the exhaust, we go through that little muffler we talked about. So the spring pressure starts to push this air back out, okay? So that is a spring actuated cylinder, as a spring actuated cylinder that we've got, that's being run by our valve, okay? So the other um, type is one that is not spring actuated. In other words, we actuate, we make it go one, uh, the two different directions uh, by changing the force that the air pressure hits, okay? And going through here, I'll step you through it. So we, we're, We've got pressurized supply air, okay, we're coming through our valve, and this is uh, the non-energized, so we're allowing, the, just as it sits, the, the air will naturally port into here, to this side of the piston, and want to make it extend, and as it extends, we're giving a pathway for the air trapped on this side of the piston to escape out through this side of the, or this port of the, um, of the uh, spool, and then exhaust in the atmosphere. Now, when we shift our valve, okay, when we shift that valve, we energize our coil and we move a new set of, uh, of, of arrows in for our drawing. But what we're doing is we're, we're moving a different uh, pathway for the air to take. So instead of going to this side, we're going to pressurize this side, okay, and we're going to get on the back side of that piston and we're going to pressure it, uh, build pressure, and it's going to force the rod in this direction to retract that air will expel through this port or through, through this lane of the, uh, of the uh, uh, spool and then will exhaust out into the atmosphere. So you can kind of see is, is depending on what kind of cylinder do you have is, is dependent upon, um, will we'll, we'll determine what uh, type of directional valve that you need. Now, sometimes you can have uh, cylinders that, uh, this is the ones that, uh, that, that don't have any springs inside the cylinders and you're gonna need uh, a solenoid on each end. But what you could have also is a section in the middle of your valve to where uh, when you are not telling the cylinder to retract or extend, you're just letting it hold or sit there in, in place. You have a valve right here that will deadhead your pressure coming in, okay? And it has nowhere to go. There's no, there's no arrows between here and here. A port will be to be, could be to the uh, extend side, the deep port could be to the retract side, or vice versa. It just depends on how you got it plumbed. But when we energize, say, uh, this coil here, we're going to push these arrows into place, meaning that our pressure is going to go through B port to this arrow. This arrow will be right here, and we'll come back through our exhaust. We de-energize it, and then it goes, uh, it pulls these back out of the way. The spool comes back, and the spool does not allow air to go to either side while neither one of these are de-energized. Now, uh, you'll also notice there you can, this is a spring, so that when we're de-energized, it's also pulling the, uh, the uh, spool back, okay? So when we, we energize this coil, 
it shifts the spool and then, or shifts the spool this way, I should just say, and then these arrows indicate the path that the air will take. So instead, now we're going to take our air pressure and we're going to port it to the A port, and this arrow will be right here, and the exhausting air will come through B port straight through out to atmosphere. But my point is, is then this is what one really looks like. You got it's marked A port and B port here with the pressure port. And these are two solenoids with electrical connectors up there. You connect your wires, your 24 volts or 120, what have you. Um, but that controls whether or not these become energized. And whichever one is energized is which way the spool is going to go. And that will then determine which direction the air goes. And that will, based on your plumbing, will say whether it's going to extend or retract. But um, this is a, this is, I wanted to mention this because you could very well run into this because a lot of times the cylinder will, will, will not necessarily go um, up and then, or retract and then extend, but it will sometimes have to sit uh, mid-stroke, you might say, okay? So this is a case uh, where you might have one of those uh, valves where it's not moving uh, to extend or retract to sit still or we're blocking the ports off. So just a different type of valve. But the biggest thing I want you to know is that our symbols here mean that these are uh, coils, okay? That's what these are. All right, and these have these have spring returns so that when we de-energize, it shoves the uh, spool back with spring pressure. It does the same thing here. It moves it back to center position and so it does the same thing here. It will move the spool with the, with the coil and then our spring, once we de-energize our coil, our spring will shove this back into the center position, block all the air, and the cylinder will not be moving at all. But I just want to make you aware of that. Now, there's a, one, there's a couple more components, and this is going to be, uh, this is in, uh, particularly important um, when you are trying to control the rate at which your cylinders extend or retract. When you're going, when you're putting those uh, feed tubes down into the dispensing tubes down in the cans, you know, speed is important because you want to get production out. You don't want them to go in there real slow, but you also don't want them to go in there real fast because you have to have a jerking motion and it, it jars things. And also, it's just more wear and tear on your components, particularly your cylinders. So, uh, we've got a couple of devices here I want to talk to you about. Uh, and these are these right here are called flow control devices, okay? This is the symbol for flow control. I made a bigger picture for you here so you can see it. And this is what one, this is one example of what a flow control will look like. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes depending on, again, the application of what you need it to do. But uh, the, you'll see one right here and one right here, okay? And this is the way they work, okay? Now notice the arrow right here. We talked about this before. That means you get some variation, okay? It's, you can adjust that, okay? So. Uh, and, and remember the principle too, that air will take the path of least resistance. It always will. So will fluid, so will fluid the liquid, but in this case, pneumatics, uh, air will do the exact same thing. So we have, let's take it this way. We have our supply air coming in here, okay? And this is a little check valve right here. This is a little ball check valve. And the air has one of two ways to go. It can go through a restricted orifice, okay, a restriction, um, and and want to back it up a little bit, okay? It can go through a restricted orifice, or it can come through and take and upseat this ball in this valve and go this way. It's going to go whichever way is easiest for it to go, okay? And if we have this thing really restricted down, choked down pretty tight, then our air is going to go in here and it's going to lift this ball off, and we're going to get full flow. We have unrestricted. Full flow. In other words, we're not controlling the flow. Okay, that's the way that works. Now, I think I've got a little graphic here. Okay, and this is the way this little ball works. Okay, so we got our high pressure on this line right here. This will be right here. Okay, and what we're doing is we're pushing this poppet off of this seat, and as it comes off the seat, we're allowing the, the air to flow by. And of course, when the pressure is reduced uh, to where the spring pressure can take over, that spring will force, its, force the poppet back into its seat and seal it off, okay? Now that's just one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is that if we have return air, and I'm gonna put this into application, but when we have return air where our pressure is this way, okay, it's got a choice to go either through the restriction or through this check valve. The thing is though, the check valve only allows direction in one, flow in one direction, okay? So we've got flow coming through here, 
but what the air is doing is actually forcing that valve on that seat like this right here. It's forcing it into that seat, so it's completely blocking it off. So this is the so this now becomes the path of least resistance, and we can control the flow coming back through in this direction. Okay, we didn't have any control going this way. It was full force going this way because of this restriction. It opted to go this way because it was easier. Okay, coming back this way, however. We are completely blocked off. There's no passing air, so it's going to have to force it all through this restriction. And we can adjust that restriction, uh, but it's going to force it through there, and all the air is going to have to go through. Now, how tight we have this restriction adjusted will determine how much flow we have, which will then determine the speed of our actuator. An actuator could be a cylinder. It could also be uh, a motor, uh, an air motor as well. But we deal mostly with cylinders in, the, in our application. I've got a little bit bigger graphic. Hopefully you can see this a little bit better. It's the same thing, but that high pressure up seats that uh, pop it on that valve. And then once the pressure is dropped and spring pressure is the dominant pressure, it forces that pop it down on its seat. So our air cannot return in this direction on this check valve, okay? can't go this direction. However, it can go in this direction. So uh, I hope that explains that. So now how does this work in our application? Okay. So let's first of all, let's, let's talk about uh, we'll, um, we'll extend this cylinder. Okay. Uh, or excuse me, we're, we will retract it. We'll, we'll do that first. Okay. Okay. So what we'll do is we have our supply here and our valve is shifted or our valve is set to where we're not energized. Okay, and our path is going to take the air through our conductors, and I've got a choice here. The air can go through the metered orifice, or it can upseat this ball and have free flow into this side of the chamber, this chamber of the, of the uh, cylinder. Okay, well, it's going to take the path of least resistance. We've got this choked off. This is the easier route, so it's going to get back here, fill up that full, with full flow. It's going to pass through there with full flow, and it's going to uh, cause us to have full pressure on this side of the cylinder and full retraction speed. So we're going to have a very fast retraction, okay? Now, the air coming out of here though, this is the, this is the other part of this, the air that we're evacuating on this side, it's got to come out here. And it's also going through a check valve, okay? Same identical check valve. But here's the difference. It goes in and it gets blocked because the air is actually pushing that poppet down on its seat even more. Okay, so it's really sealing it off. So it's forcing the air to go through this metered orifice right here. So we can adjust and control the speed of our retraction with this uh, uh, check valve, uh, this uh, uh, flow control valve, by uh, how much metering uh, we are allowing the air to go through. Okay, let me say, I kind of bumbled that, bumbled that a little bit. Let me say it again. So we're going to meter the air exiting this side of the cylinder through our metering uh, orifice, and we have adjustment on that. And so while we are giving it full force on the, to, from this side to um, retract it, we are choking off the air that's exiting, okay, and we're choking that off, and we're going to slow that piston. That's, that choking it off slows that retraction speed. Okay? The exact opposite happens when we hit our solenoid, we energize that solenoid and our valve shifts. Now we have our supply air going through this arrow, okay, these two arrows would be right here, and this arrow would then now go to this side, okay? and we run into our orifice, or we can free flow through here. Well, the air is going to free flow into here, fill up this side of the chamber, and we, if we didn't have this, it would have a full speed uh, of extension. Okay. However, this air right here, just the flip side of what we talked about earlier, the air on this side is going to be forced to either go up into that ball or that poppet or the, the metered orifice. Well, it's sealing off the pressure behind it. It's actually sealing off that poppet on that seat even tighter. So now it's forcing the air. So this valve right here will control the speed of the extension of the cylinder. Um, by the, ex by the exhausting air. And on the flip side, when we shift our valve, um, this one will provide, will, uh, this one will provide pre full pressure, but we will uh, control the retraction through the control valve right here, the, the flow control right here, 
uh, if I was choking off the air exiting on this side. So that's how a flow control valve works. Um, and again, if you have a cylinder that's running too fast, that's extending too fast, or retracting, you have options. You can adjust these flow controls here too. So anyway, that's just kind of an idea. Uh, I mean, uh, give you an idea how this works. Again, if you control the flow, then you control the speed. Okay, regardless of what type of actuator it is. But that's the things I wanted to cover in ferment and um, in the. Uh, pneumatics part of this class. Uh, so anyway, this concludes the pneumatics portion. Um, I hope you got something out of it. Um, but anyway, uh, I've got some more uh, videos that I'll pop up there for you just to kind of give you some uh, uh, graphics to look at and see kind of the operation. But uh, other than that, uh, that concludes the pneumatics portion of the class. I hope you've enjoyed it and we will talk to you soon. Thank you for watching.